Hi, I'm Ben with Shock Service LLC. You can find us at shockservice.com. And in this video, I'm gonna show you a basic rebuild on a set of King 2.5 smoothie shocks. These ones happen to have come off of the back end of a Tundra, so they've got a couple of unique features, mainly that they have a stem top or a pin top rather than a traditional bearing. And these ones also have compression adjusters. These are in pretty good shape. Uh, this is kind of what we'd expect for a set of shocks that have seen 50 to 100,000 miles. They've been well protected. The shafts have been well protected. Uh, they've been left pretty clean to keep uh, salt and uh, corrosion off of them. So this is very common. And the process I'm expecting is gonna be pretty straightforward. Uh, again, in this video, I'm going to try and make this a uh, relatively short video, kind of um, the real basics of the process of rebuilding a set of shocks. Of course, shocks come with a lot of different options and features and uh, variations, uh, but the process is more or less the same and should also be similar across other brands of shocks. So again, in order to keep this video short, I'm going to jump straight to it. And the first thing we're going to do is check the position of the internal floating piston in the reservoir to see where it's at so that we know where we want to reset it. Also, that's a good indication of whether the shocks have lost oil uh, and if it would be the first sign if uh, we might be expecting more damage inside of the cylinders. Almost all high performance shocks are gonna have some form of reservoir. Uh, the reservoir houses an internal floating piston and its job is to separate the nitrogen pressure from the oil. That nitrogen pressure pushes on the internal floating piston. That keeps pressure on the oil. So as the shock cycles, it prevents the oil from cavitating, aer aerating, basically bubbling. And that's what keeps the shock working precisely. So if you're spending the kind of money that these, uh, that these sell for, um, you're going to end up with some form of reservoir so that you can get the performance out of the shock. If your shock does not have a reservoir, it's likely built as an emulsion shock where the oil is mixed in with the nitrogen. So this process isn't going to apply. But again, this should apply in most cases, uh, whether the reservoir is mounted remotely or attached to the shock as a piggyback. On the end of the reservoir, you'll have a Schrader valve, just like you'd find on a car tire or a bicycle tire. We'll remove the cap on that, that just threads off. And then, since the shock is under pressure, or should be, hopefully, we're going to point this away from us. I'm going to use a valve core tool. You can get these at any auto parts store uh, or bicycle shop. We'll let the pressure out of that reservoir. <clears throat> and again, something between about a 150 to 250 PSI. If there is no pressure coming out of the end of the shock, we know that the shock has lost pressure. Um, next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove the valve core. The number one reason or the number one issue that we find with a shock that has lost uh, pressure is a valve core that has rattled loose. So if you're having trouble keeping pressure in your reservoirs, the very first thing you should do is buy one of these tools and make sure that that valve core is snugged up. So that is what the valve core looks like, tiny little thing, but that is what seals that Schrader valve. So now with this removed, the end part of this reservoir will breathe freely. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take this end cap, push it into the reservoir to expose the retaining ring. Sometimes, or oftentimes, you can actually hear it, there's a little bit of dirt in there, but that's not too bad. Um, so that'll expose the retaining ring. You can use a flat screwdriver to remove that. I use a pick, and we'll just be careful not to scar the cylinder. So that retaining ring comes out, and that's just snapped into this groove. And there is quite a bit of dirt in there. So I'm going to wipe it clean so we don't hurt the end cap. And now the best way to remove this end cap is to use a valve core tool. And the end of that will thread onto the Schrader valve. And then that should come out, hopefully. There we go. So there is a little bit of oil in there and that's normal, uh, although this is a little bit more than we'd expect. As the shock cycles, there's an O-ring on the internal floating piston, as you'll see. Uh, that keeps the internal, uh, the, the cylinder walls lubricated, so it will kind of build up, but again, it's a little bit more than we want to see. The end cap here looks like it's in pretty good shape. 
no scarring, no marks. So we'll of course replace that O-ring eventually. But for now, I'm gonna put this aside. I'm gonna clean out a bit of that oil. Now the next thing I'm going to do is with this shock fully extended, I'm going to measure the distance of that internal floating piston so I can see where it lands in relation to this cylinder. To find the position of the internal floating piston, we're going to measure from the outer edge of the cylinder to the internal point of the internal floating piston, not to the edge, to the deepest part you can get to. So on this particular shock, we're looking at about four and a quarter inches, and that'll put the IFP right around there. And that's pretty typical. We normally only see about an inch or two of oil towards the hose side. Uh, that should show you how reservoirs really don't have anything to do with cooling. There's only a little bit of oil in here. The job of the reservoir is really to separate the nitrogen pressure from the oil. So we'll check the second shock as well, measuring to the same point. And I'm also seeing four and a quarter inches, which is a good sign because that indicates that the shocks have not lost any oil. Uh, I'm gonna make a note with that measurement because when we reassemble the shocks, we'll try to make sure that that internal floating piston ends up around there. And it doesn't have to be precise. Uh, again, whether there's an inch of oil in here, two inches of oil, uh, it's not really gonna change the performance of the shock. Uh, as these shocks cycle for about a 12 inch length, that internal floating piston's really only gonna move about an inch, inch and a half. So as long as the IFP's positioned somewhere in here, we're gonna be in good shape. Uh, since these shocks have compression adjusters, I'm just going to check them real quick to make sure that they're moving smoothly, rotating smoothly. Uh, and they are. I don't feel any binding. So that's a good sign. We won't have to touch those. And I'm simply going to open them up all the way to help them uh, flow freely when we fill them back up. The first step in removing the shaft assembly is to remove the wiper cap. This wiper cap just holds the wiper seal and just keeps dirt and it's the first layer of protection for the shock. So there's three holes. Uh, you'll see one down there too. Uh, the two opposite each other are for a spanner wrench that you'll see in a second. And the third, which sometimes gets gummed up with uh, grease or dirt, houses a set screw. If you don't loosen this set screw, you're gonna damage the shock. So the first thing we're gonna do is get an Allen wrench in there, nice and snug. If you break this, out, uh, this uh, set screw or strip it, you're gonna have to drill it out. That's a huge mess because it's hard to get to with the shaft in there. So be careful. They shouldn't be, there you go, so it snapped loose. That's what we typically wanna see. If someone had serviced the shocks before and used a bunch of Loctite, that's where things get a little hairy because uh, it can take quite a bit of force. But luckily, this one's pretty smooth and they usually are. So we don't have to remove the entire set screw. We just need to loosen it up enough because all it's doing is it's locking it against the internal shaft retainer to prevent it from spinning and coming off. So just a few turns and that should do it. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our spanner wrench, seat it into those two holes. Uh, I'm gonna reposition the shock now. Sometimes you can just move it loose, other times it's going to take a little bit, uh, so with a dead blow hammer or a small hammer, just tap it a couple of times. And it should just crack it loose enough that you can then spin it loose. So when we remove this, there shouldn't be any oil that comes out. Uh, again, this only houses the wiper seal, which is mainly there to wipe dirt off of the shaft. So that's going to come off. And then once that's unthreaded, it's going to slide out. That now exposes the shaft retainer. And just like the end cap on the reservoir, this gets pushed down to expose the retaining ring. Once the retaining ring comes out, the entire shaft assembly will come out of the cylinder. Of course, at that point, the oil will come out of the shock. So I'm going to reposition this and show you how that's done. Um, one interesting note is if you see one mark that uh, I'm not sure if it's gonna show up there, but that's where the set screw was marked into. The number of set screw marks you'll see on this retaining uh, shaft retainer typically indicates, or almost always indicates, how many times the shocks have been opened. Um, so it's a quick way of counting. Sometimes when someone services a shock, they'll also put markings in there. Uh, but this one, these have clearly never been serviced before, so that's uh, 
they're in good shape. Uh, so again, I'm going to reposition these now. So this is a little bit harder to show on camera than uh, I thought, but I'll do my best here. So again, we've got the shaft retainer in there. That needs to get pushed down into the cylinder to expose the retaining ring. Um, sometimes you can push it in with just your fingers. I'm going to have to lean this in towards me. Oh, that one actually went in pretty easily. Not all the way. Uh, but another trick is if you take some one inch PVC pipe, cut it like this into two half circles. Uh, you can bring the wiper cap down and that gives you a lot more surface area to push down on. So I'm going to try and get this down a bit further. Also uh, a reminder, we removed the, we've removed the end cap of that reservoir. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, and there's pressure in there as you're pushing down in here. You're also fighting that pressure So make sure that the end cap is removed uh, or at least the valve core has been removed from the Schrader valve uh, But I highly advise recommend uh, remove the uh, entire end cap So I'm gonna push down on this a little bit more Ah, oh, here we go um, Just like anything else you have to overcome the initial force uh, of things sitting where they have for for many years. You'll notice I'm wearing gloves. This is an important step uh, To wear gloves in because sometimes as you're pushing down on that if it all of a sudden gives and it comes down You can pinch your hands uh, in there. So uh, As with anything make sure that you're wearing the proper safety equipment so the Next step is to remove that retaining ring just like we did in the reservoir um, let's See if I can find split there it is so that retaining ring comes out and now we have to just pull on this shaft until the entire assembly comes out there is oil in there so as you do this it comes to a stage where when the shaft comes out oil is going to go all over the place so I normally put this shock in a bucket and then we'll put a towel over it there's a lot of ways to remove the shaft assembly from the cylinder uh, some of them are as simple as clamping the end of the shock in a vise and pulling on it. Uh, sometimes if you're careful, you can put it down on the ground, put your foot on the reservoir fitting. Again, being very, very careful. You don't want to put a lot of force on that and yanking on it. Uh, of course, as that shaft comes out of the cylinder, oil is going to come with it. So no matter what you do, make sure that you've got a towel around it in order to keep it, uh, keep that oil under control. But I'll show you a trick that we use here. It takes a little bit more <clears throat> work or a few more steps, but uh, it requires the least amount of force. So I have a, uh, a bucket. I've cut a notch into it that helps hold that shaft. I'm of course going to put a towel over it. Uh, and then what I've done is I've put the end cap back on the reservoir. We've got the retaining ring in there. We've got the Schrader valve with the valve core and a small little bicycle pump. Now, and I'm going to say this twice, do not use shop air to do this trick, you got to use a bicycle pump. If you use shop air, nitrogen, uh, any high pressure, uh, it will shoot that cylinder out of the. Uh, it'll, it'll shoot that shaft out of the cylinder. The oil will go with it. You can get hurt. Um, so never, never use high pressure when you're doing this. We're using a small, small bicycle pump. Um, uh, it's probably two or three psi. Very, very small amounts of pressure. But the idea here is to pressurize the end of it just until that shaft assembly comes out of the back of the cylinder. Um, and what I'll do is I'll normally I keep it fully covered, but we'll see if we can show it to you here. So very, very slowly, I better wear a glove here. <coughs> um, I'm hold that. So you've see, you see that that shaft, uh, that shaft retainer has kind of come out. So now I'm just going to add a little bit of pressure. And what tends to happen is it just reaches a point where Oh, there we go. Just about. Another trick is if you push in on the shaft, as the shaft goes into the shock, it takes up space and it's going to try and push the shaft retainer out. So I didn't want to keep pressurizing this. So I'm going to try and push the shaft into the cylinder and you'll see that the retainer is coming out of it. There we go. Move the pump. Move the pressure. 
All right. And there we have the shaft assembly. And normally I just position that in there and I'll let it sit for a little while to drip. And then we'll clean it up, get the oil off of it, um, and move on to servicing the individual components. On most high performance shocks, the bottom of the shock is gonna have a bearing that's held in place with two snap rings. On either side of the bearing, you're gonna have misalignment spacers. So the bearings, this particular one has a 5 8 inch inner diameter. Some smaller shocks will have a half inch bearing. But on the larger bearings, in order to taper it down to the bolt needed, uh, I believe these are metric, but the most common is uh, a 5 8 inch bearing tapered down to a half inch bolt. So you'll have these misalignment spacers. Some of them might be made out of stainless steel. These ones are made out of zinc plated uh, regular steel. And they're pressed in from both sides of the bearing. When the shocks are brand new, you can typically push them in and pull them out by hand. Uh, however, once they've been exposed to the elements and salt and water has gotten in there, they tend to, or possibly can, corrode and get stuck in there. So the best way to remove them, especially if you can't pull them out with pliers or by hand, is to uh, squeeze one side of them in a vise. Now with these being steel spacers, I can crank on this pretty hard. For stainless steel spacers, you've got to be a bit more careful. Of course, the benefit with stainless steel is it's not going to corrode. So with the bearing uh, locked in the vise, uh, also these happen to have welded lower rod ends. Most shocks will have an aluminum threaded rod end, uh, but the process is the same for both. Um, with the misalignment spacer in the vise, I'm going to carefully hit the side of the shaft, of course I'm going to protect it with a little bit of rubber, and I'm hoping to knock the shaft away from the misalignment spacer. Uh, if you're having trouble with one side, move on to the other. We really only have to remove one side, so whichever one comes out the easiest is the one that we'll do. So uh, hopefully we'll get lucky here. And again, I've got it well protected with a couple layers of rubber. You can use a towel and then a dead blow protect, you know, plastic hammer. Oh, it's actually not too bad. So now we got to be careful. There we go. That was actually not too bad. The other shaft I did uh, took quite a bit of work. You can see that they're pretty grimy and dirty. Uh, we'll get to those retaining rings to press out that bearing soon. But now, in order to get the other misalignment spacer out, since this is a 5 8 inch inner diameter bearing, I'm going to use a 5 8 inch stud. Uh, in order to protect the shock, I'm going to put on some aluminum vice guards. There we go. <clears throat> and let's see if we can knock that other spacer out. There it goes. Perfect. So now we haven't hurt the shaft any, we've got the misalignment spacers removed, and now we can remove the bearing. The bearing, we first have to remove snap rings, just one on either side. And the first step there is of course to clean this up, uh, get it as clean as possible, use a nylon brush, use some WD-40, really clean that up. Then we're going to use a, a high quality set of snap ring pliers, get those well seated. And these snap rings do have a ten tendency to fly out, so uh, either keep it covered, of course, wear eye protection. No. Is this whatever? And it should come right out. Uh, of course, we've got one on the other side. We'll do the same thing. And the key is to get these pliers really well seated. And that one came out a lot easier. Just a little bit more crud in there, so we'll clean this up a bit more. And then in order to uh, remove the bearing, we're going to use a socket. So if I'm not using a hydraulic press to remove the bearing, uh, first thing I'll do is I'll put it into a vise. Uh, we've got two quarter inch steel plates. Uh, any squared up plate uh, will nicely square up that uh, rod end in the uh, socket on the bearing. And then we'll use the vise to uh, crack that bearing loose. Okay, and that's not too bad. So what we've done now is we've only moved it a little bit, but we've moved the bearing all the way to the back side. 
Since that bearing moved pretty easily in the vise, I'm hoping that I can just knock it out, uh, supporting it with my hand. Of course, wearing a glove, being careful. You can always prop this up on a piece of wood or rubber or anything you have or a larger socket underneath it. Uh, but I think I should be able to get it out this way. There we go. Before we can press a new bearing in, we need to install one snap ring. That way the bearing has something to press up against. Uh, we always use brand new snap rings. Uh, you can of course clean out the old ones, I'm sure they're fine, but they're really cheap and this is one way we can make sure that when that new bearing goes in, it's seated nice and square and you don't have to fight uh, the, the second snap ring. So just like before, we'll take our snap ring pliers, make sure that they're very well seated in there. We've got our eye protection on and we'll carefully move that snap ring into place. And there's different schools of thought as to how to position that snap ring. Uh, some people like to put it at the top. Uh, most of the time we put it at the bottom. It shouldn't get in the way and I don't think it matters uh, however you put it in there. Now with that snap ring in place, we're going to take a little bit of oil, lubricate the bearing, square that up in there, and it should somewhat seat itself. And now we're going to put that back into the vise and use a socket to press it in. At this stage it's very important to make sure that the rod end, the bearing, and the socket are squarely positioned in the vise. Again we're using our quarter inch plate steel to make sure everything is nice and square. And I'm going to slowly turn the vise to seat that bearing. If it gets cockeyed, if it, if it requires too much force, if you're fighting it, back off Really make sure everything is square because you don't want to damage the rod end, especially if uh, you've got aluminum. So I'm going to slowly tighten the vise. Oh, and you kind of saw it square up there. That's what we want. So very carefully go by feel. And that's what we want. Nice, smooth movement. And we want to get it right up against that snap ring. Nice and tight without overdoing it. We'll back off. Want to make sure that that snap ring groove is visible all the way around, and it is. And so now we should be able to install that second snap ring. Get that nice and seated. Make sure that it's seated all the way around on both sides. And now we have a new bearing installed in the bottom of our shaft, and the misalignment spacers are ready to be put in from either side. In order to remove the components, from the shaft assembly, we'll need to remove the shaft nut. After that, the components will be removed and we have to maintain the exact order in which they're placed so that when we assemble it, they go back in the exact same sequence. If this is your first time rebuilding a set of shocks, this would be an important stage to either photograph or better yet, keep the second shock as reference. So service one, finish it, because that way you can always copy the other one. Um, what we'll do is we'll remove the components and lay them out in the exact order in which they're uh, removed, so that way we can put them back together. Uh, keep in mind that many of the components are side specific, so the piston does have a compression and rebound side. Also the compression and rebound shims are very different. Uh, as the shock compresses or moves up into the cylinder, oil goes from the top down to the bottom, so the bottom side of the piston is compression and the top side of the piston is rebound. So it's important to remember that. In this particular rebuild, we're not going to be going into valving. We're simply going to disassemble the components, change out the seals and O-rings, and reassemble them, again, in the exact same sequence uh, as we have it here. So the first thing we'll do is remove the shaft nut. We have it nice, squarely secured in the vise. And this should take a little bit of force, but not much. So very carefully, we'll take the shaft nut, and sometimes a, a piece of butcher paper works really well too, that way you can mark things out. Shaft nut spacer. Now on OEM kits, the um, rebound shims are actually on a little holder. On most other shocks, the shims will be right on top of the piston. We'll put that next. Next. 
Now when you remove the piston, be careful because the compression shims typically stick to the bottom as they are here. So we'll remove those shims, lay them out here. So now for reference, the side of the piston that has the larger ports, that goes up. The side with the fewer larger ports, that goes down. After that, we've got another washer. And then the shaft retainer. Um, you've got the main seal retainer that sometimes that sticks, um, that falls out, so that's gonna go in there. And then of course, we've got the wiper cap. The next two components we're gonna address are the wiper cap, as well as the shaft retainer. The wiper cap holds the wiper seal. It's also got an O-ring on it. Those will both get removed. The shaft retainer has a larger O-ring. It has a DU bushing on one end. These rarely have to be replaced uh, unless the shock has heavy side loading where, where you'll see wear on one side or a bent shaft or a damaged shaft that cycled through the, the, the shock. But this looks like it's in great shape. This can be removed, although it is tricky. You have to go at it with a punch from the back end. And sometimes you can get that to come out. Sometimes it's seized. Uh, another trick <clears throat> is it does have a seam on it. So if you can find that seam and use a flat screwdriver, you can sometimes peel the DU bushing out. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you just end up scarring the seal cap to the point where you've got to buy a new one. Uh, it happens about 10% of the time, so we keep those in stock. But luckily, those DU bushings don't have to get replaced too often. On the opposite side, we have the main seal. Uh, if you're not seeing that main seal, you might be showing the main seal retainer, so that gets removed, that just pops right out. So we have the main seal, and then we have an O-ring internally. So we'll start by removing these. Uh, I tend to find that a flat screwdriver works the best to remove the main seal. Uh, the main seal does have a groove on one side of it, so that groove, when we're reassembling it, will go down towards the seal cap, uh, or sorry, shaft retainer. Then we have an O-ring that's kind of further down in here, but comes right out. And then of course, this large O-ring is gonna get removed as well. <clears throat> and the wiper cap, we'll remove this O-ring here. And then the wiper seal, just like we did with the bearings, I'm going to put a socket in there, and most of the time I can get this out just holding it in my palm, so uh, wear gloves, be careful, otherwise you can prop this up in a vise, or sometimes on um, sometimes on the uh, shaft retainer, or the IFP from the shock, but be careful. Normally I just get it out in my palm. So there we go, and that's the wiper seal. Now we've got our seal kits, and they tend to show up in little bags like this. Uh, they, they contain way more parts, more O-rings and seals than you'll need. They're kind of universal, so they'll have parts for bypass shocks, for piggyback shocks, and, and, and other things. So we'll open these up and pull out the O-rings and seals that match the ones that we've removed. And in the next step, I'll show you how we put those uh, into the wiper cap and shaft retainer. I've gone ahead and cleaned up the seal caps, took most of the dirt and oil off of them. First, we'll start by installing the main O-ring. I like to use shock oil just to keep everything lubricated. This will help with the assembly process and prevent them from drying up uh, and getting stuck inside the shock. So use plenty of oil. Next, we'll do the internal O-rings. These are the clear ones. So they're easy to find in the kit. Just gonna use my finger to work that around. The second one, and there, and again with the main seals, the groove goes down. These ones require a little bit more force, but generally you can get it in there with your fingers, or you can use a screwdriver to help work that down.
the second one. Be careful not to hurt the seals. They're pretty heavy duty. This one's kind of giving me a bit of trouble, so we got to be careful. Sometimes you can just push on that part of it. Goes right in. And then, of course, the main seal retainers will help hold those in place. <clears throat> and we have new shaft retainers ready to go. On the wiper caps, we're again going to use plenty of oil, but on these, to make sure that they're installed nice and square, we're going to go ahead and put these into the vise. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. I've got the wiper cap squared up with the wiper seal between two quarter inch plates of steel. This is like we did the bearings making sure that they're nice and even, nice and square. And I'm going to apply a small amount of force to make sure that that seal seats within that wiper cap. Now a very, very important step is to make sure that the set screw is tightened below the surface. If that set screw is sticking out or if you forget to tighten that in there as you tighten the vise, it will damage the threads. You will need to replace the wiper cap. So again, make sure that that uh, set screw is well seated. Now we have that all nice and square. I'm going to slowly apply force and it should go in very smoothly and it should go in square. Good. I'm going to set that in a bit deeper. And then you just feel with your finger, make sure it's that that's nice and flush. And on the back end, it looks like it's there. So the last step is to put the new O-ring on there and we have a new wiper cap ready to go. Before we get to assembling the shaft, I like to do a quick inspection. We're going to do two things. We're going to check the surface and we're going to make sure that it's nice and square and straight. To make sure it's straight, we put it on a water level. This water level has a groove. So if we just sit that shaft on that water level, and if you look from the side as you're rotating, you shouldn't see any gaps. It should be nice, even, and straight. And both of these shafts are. The next thing we're going to look for is imperfections in the shaft. This one, and this is pretty typical of an OEM application. One shock is oftentimes forward of the axle, the other one's behind it. So the shock that's behind the axle is much more protected. The shock that's in front of the axle, we highly recommend protecting that with a rubber guard. Uh, but you can see that this one's been chipped a little bit. It's actually not too bad. Also, chips aren't too big of a deal. Uh, you'd be surprised at how much the high pressure seals in these shocks will seal up, but you can feel a little imperfections in there. So what I'm going to do to help smooth that up a bit, and of course I'm going to tell this customer to better protect this shaft. I'm going to put a bit of oil on there. And this can also be done when it's on the vehicle. Uh, this is also at the bottom of the shock, so the only time the shock's going to compress down here is under a full bottom out. I'm expecting a Tundra uh, not to do that too often, so I'm not going to worry about replacing the shaft. I'm just going to go in here, smooth up the these bumps with an emery stone, just a soft emery stone. Don't use sandpaper, don't use a file. You can find these emery stones on Amazon, and they're pretty cheap. And most uh, most higher-end hardware stores will have these as well. And I'm just knocking off, there we go, much better. So just, it's just taking off the high points. I don't want to go too heavy on it. I don't want to get through the chrome. But that's all this is going to take. And very little work. You can, it actually feels a lot smoother now. So I'm happy with reinstalling and reusing this shaft. When it comes to assembling the shaft, this is where if you kept your parts nice and organized, uh, this process is really easy and straightforward. It's just the opposite of the way that it was taken apart. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put some shock oil on the shaft. This will just help put the seals on there. We'll begin with the wiper cap. I've gone ahead and unthreaded that set screw. Remember, we threaded that into the wiper cap when we pressed the seal in. So we're going to pull that out and 
that's going to go onto the shaft. Next is going to be the shaft retainer. I think earlier in the video I also called it a seal cap. Uh, those names are kind of interchangeable. So shaft retainer seal cap is on next. We'll give it a couple of turns just to keep it square. And then we're going to put the compression shims on next. Whenever you're dealing with these shim stacks, and we're not, oh, we're not touching on valving in this video, but all you need to know is that the largest shims go up against the piston, smaller shims go downward, and it should be in a pyramid stack. Sometimes there's some variation of that, but key thing being largest shim goes up against the piston. So the piston has an O-ring in here that kind of presses out on the um, wear band. That wear band is going to go on later. Um, one side of the piston is going to have three large ports. That's going to go down towards the bottom of the shaft. The upper portion is going to have six main ports. That goes up. So that'll go on next. Then we're going to have the rebound shims. And on OEM kits, they come with this little uh, holder. And that just needs to get lined up on a pin. Then we have the shaft nut spacer and the shaft nut. These are, these are locking nuts. Uh, on some versions, you'll find a standard nut, and on those, we, uh, we do use some Loctite. But on these, if they're in good shape, you can oftentimes reuse them. But we keep plenty in stock uh, and, re and uh, replace them frequently, but you can typically reuse it. So then, I'm going to go ahead and get this nice and snug. And I'm just going to make sure everything is squared up, nothing's pinched, nothing's binding. That all looks good. And there's no torque specs on this, we just go by feel. Nice and tight. So we have a finished shaft assembly, and as soon as the cylinders are ready, uh, this is ready to, uh, to get installed. So I've been letting the cylinders drain, uh, just letting them sit downward so most of the oil has come out. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is remove the internal floating piston from the reservoir. There is going to be some residual oil in there. Also, there's an O-ring that we want to remove. Uh, this would also be a good stage where we would replace or fix any fittings or reservoir hoses. These are standard hydraulic fittings, so any local hydraulic shop will have them. Uh, they can typically rebuild a hose in a couple of minutes relatively affordably. So the fittings are standard hydraulic fittings. The hose itself is a very high pressure hydraulic hose. So even if you see some minor cuts in it, there's no need to worry. There's a steel braided liner in there. And even if that steel braiding is exposed, the shock's in great shape. It takes a lot to get through that. So I'd of course protect the hose if that was the case, uh, or of course it can be replaced. So the compression adjusters are open. We've got the end cap removed and uh, if you're jumping to the section of the video we show that earlier, I'll, I'll post a link to that. And you'll notice that on the end of the internal floating piston you'll see a threaded hole. For that, we'll use a quarter inch coarse thread rod. Another thing that works well is an eye bolt. So we'll thread that in there. I've, uh, I've got a washer on the end of it that'll give me a good grip. Now at the very beginning, it might take a bit of force because we're overcoming a vacuum, but you can now hear that moving. So oil is gonna come out of here. Um, see if I can do this without making a mess. There we go, we'll drain that reservoir. And then my trick for wiping out the inside of a cylinder uh, is one of these surgical clamps and a paper towel. And got a little bit more oil coming out of that cylinder. I didn't show this to you earlier, but this is what used shock oil looks like. So there's metal particles in there. Um, very typical. I've seen shock oil much, much, dark, much darker than that. Uh, but no major chunks, no major pieces. I didn't see any scarring in the cylinders. That's just what uh, shock oil looks like. The oil's broken down. There's a little bit of debris in there, but that's pretty much to be expected. And 
Now, after a little bit more cleaning, we'll make sure we get the rest of this shock oil out. We've got the internal floating piston on which we'll place the O-ring and the wear band. Again, even though it's called a wear band, it doesn't actually wear out. As long as that's in good shape, we can reuse that. With the internal floating piston cleaned up and a new O-ring installed, it's ready to go into the reservoir. But before I do that, I figured you might be curious what a reservoir with a compression adjuster looks like. So you can see the secondary compression shim stack in there. Uh, a lot of people ask if it's just a pinch valve, but it's a lot more than that. The compression adjuster knob, as you turn that, it's either diverting oil through that secondary compression shim stack, adding to the damping, or it's diverting it around the shim stack uh, to take it out of the equation. So it's a very well engineered, very, very well designed piece. And this is one of the nice things about opening up a set of shocks like this. You get a whole new appreciation for how well they're made. So I'm going to position this reservoir on the edge of this table. It's kind of awkward with the... Uh, See if I can get this with this. There we go. The video makes things a lot harder. So I'm going to put a bit of oil on the internal floating piston. It goes flat side in. First thing we're going to try and do is just get the O-ring past that snap ring or that uh, retaining ring groove. Now we've got the wear band. that into that groove. The rotation, the orientation really doesn't matter too much. And the key is to do this by hand so you can kind of feel it go in square. There we go. There we go. And then I typically use a dead blow hammer. Push that down to the very end of that cylinder. At this point, if you remember at the very beginning, we had a set internal floating piston position of four and a quarter. At least I think that's correct. And now we're looking at about four and three quarters. So in this particular case, the compression adjuster is taking, uh, taking up a bit of space. So once we're done, that internal floating piston is gonna move out about a half an inch. We might bring it out a little bit more than that since we've got room to spare. But with that installed, uh, I'm actually going to install one of these retaining rings and you'll see why in a little bit. So that when we're filling it with oil and cycling it, that'll prevent the internal floating piston from popping out. But now I'm going to place this in a vise and we'll get to filling it with oil and inserting the shaft. We've got the shock cylinder mounted vertically in the vise. Uh, it's important because we want to have the reservoir hose pointed downward uh, to the reservoir. As we fill that cylinder with oil, Oil flows down, air bubbles work their way up, and in a standard remote reservoir shock, oftentimes you can just let it sit for uh, 20 minutes and the air bubbles will work their way up. Because we've got compression adjusters, it's a little bit trickier. We've got more air cavities that we need to get oil through. So I've got my threaded rod inside of the internal floating piston. I've got the retaining ring at the end of that reservoir, and I'm going to cycle that internal floating piston back and forth, moving oil back and forth through this hose until all the air bubbles have worked their way out. So we've got the compression adjuster open and I'm just going to fill the, uh, the cylinder with oil to about there. Okay. So that's going to slowly work its way down, but we'll go ahead and help it. Okay, you can hear the air bubbles. And we're just gonna do this. Until we stop hearing air bubbles and all we're hearing is oil flowing. So I've cycled that until all I hear is oil moving, no air bubbles, no gurgling. Oil's dropped down a little bit, which is a good sign. So now, we're ready to install the shaft assembly. We'll get the retaining, the shaft retainer and the wiper cap up by the rod end. <clears throat> we've got the piston. We've got a cleaned up white, uh, wear band. And these will always show a little bit of wear. Uh, and that's fine. I believe they're impregnated with, uh, with, uh, with bronze. So um, it's all by design. Obviously, if you see tears or issues, it'd be a good idea to replace them. But 
These ones look like they're in pretty good shape and they've got many, many thousands of miles ahead of them. So we're going to carefully seat that piston. Now, this is a good stage to make sure you cover the top because once it hits the oil, it'll want to squirt some up. And all I'm doing is I'm moving the piston just below the oil level. And I'm going to cycle it a couple of times. The, uh, the piston has uh, three uh, small bleed holes in there so the oil doesn't have to go through the valving shims. Still has quite a bit of resistance so we have to put a bit of force on there. But all I'm doing is I'm moving it a few times to make sure that all the air bubbles have worked their way out from the bottom of the piston out through the top. All right, that's feeling good and it sounds good. So I'm gonna add some more shock oil. And I've got the shock oil to about there now. We're gonna get this shaft up as high as we can get it. Again, careful not to break the top of the oil level. All right, so the oil's worked its way down. Okay. I've now got the oil pretty close to the retaining ring. I'm gonna do a quick check on the internal floating piston. Four and three quarters, so that's fully seated. And uh, just because I know what I'm doing, I'm going to pull it back just a tiny bit. We want to get a little bit more oil into this, res this reservoir. I like to do that with OEM shocks just because if a customer adjusts the fittings and a little oil weeps out, I want to make sure there's a little bit of oil, a um, little extra oil in there. So now I'm going to move the cylinder, I'm sorry, the shaft up a bit higher, careful not to breach the top of the oil level. Now I'm gonna go right up to that retaining ring. And this is kind of the trickiest part. We're trying to assemble the shock without any air bubbles, so there's a few tricks to that. I'm going to move the shaft retainer down. And what I do is I move it down just until the O-ring touches the cylinder. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to push down on the shaft. As the shaft goes into the cylinder, it takes up space. That oil needs somewhere to go, so it's gonna work its way up. And what I'm looking for is the point at which the oil starts to come out from the bottom of that O-ring. And then once I see that oil, I'm gonna push the entire assembly into the shock with my finger, so. Um, And this is something you just have to get a feel for. All right. And it's not doing quite what I wanted it to do. Oh no, it's actually close. All right. There we go. Well, we were right there. There it goes. All right, there we go, good. So as soon as the oil starts to come out, you know that there's no air in the system. Once we force that in there, we're getting the shaft retainer below the retaining ring groove. We'll put that retaining ring in there. Make sure that it's seated. This is a bit awkward in this position, so I apologize, but all right, we're good. Nice. That looks like it's seated. I'm gonna do a quick double check on the internal floating piston. We're at four inches, perfect. So it's gonna seat up a little bit. So that's given us about a quarter inch of extra oil, which is fantastic.
we'll go ahead and thread the wiper cap down. All right. Now you don't want to tighten this quite yet because you'll just get it to spin. The next stage is, oops, almost got ahead of myself there. We're going to install the end of that reservoir. There we go. So, got that pushed in. Retaining ring goes back in. Trader valve core goes in. And before you pressurize the shock, mentally go through your checklist. Make sure you've got retaining rings everywhere they need to be. Uh, we know that they're in there. Fittings are tight. Everything is tight. And I've got my nitrogen tank set to 100 PSI. We're not going too high at this stage, just about enough to get things seated. Safety glasses on, pointed away from you. Uh, take all your safety precautions, but we're just going to do a quick charge here. Good. Great. So even though it's just uh, 100 PSI, it's pushed up on this uh, wiper cap, which is what we wanted. That's pushing friction or putting friction on that seal cap. So now using our spanner wrench, we can go in here and snug this up. And again, you don't want to go too tight. We want to be able to remove it without uh, cranking on it. And we'll tighten down that set screw. The next thing I'm going to do is wipe off a bit of this residual oil. We're going to lay them flat on the bench. And I'm going to pressurize them to between 300 and 400 PSI. And I'll make a note of the pressure that they're pressurized for. So of course the shocks aren't going to be left at that high pressure. But we pressurize them extra high uh, as part of a pressure test. And there we go. Good. And that way we know if we let the shock sit for 24 or 48 hours at 350 PSI. And if we come back and there's no oil, we know that everything is nice and tight. We can bring the pressures down to 150 to 200. And we know that the shocks are ready to give back to the customer. Otherwise, if we come back and we find a puddle of oil, open them back up fix the issue, reassemble them, and let them sit again. So I'll go ahead and I'll do that, and we'll check back after that, and we'll see how we did. It's been a bit over 24 hours, so I stopped by the shop to check on these shocks. Uh, not a single drop of oil has come out of them, so that's a good sign. That's what we were hoping for. Also, I pressurized the shocks to 300 PSI uh, after I left, and once I checked it, we're at about 275, and that's pretty typical just by putting a pressure gauge, since we're dealing with such a small amount of volume, uh, you're going to lose quite a bit of pressure pretty quickly. So that's what I was hoping to see. You also, you don't need a fancy manifold like this, just any pressure gauge that reads up to 300, 400 PSI, press it on there. You can check it. Um, so that all looks good. Uh, the next step is I'm going to bring the pressures down to about 200 PSI for this customer. Uh, we'll put the misalignment spacers back into the bearings. They just press right in. Uh, sometimes I hold them in place with a zip tie, but that's all there is to it. Hopefully, hopefully you found this video helpful. Uh, if you did, make sure to subscribe. We're going to have a lot more videos coming out soon. Uh, There's a lot of stuff I glossed over and didn't touch on, but we're hoping to post more and more videos as we uh, service more shocks. Uh, also, make sure to check out our website, shockservice.com. And if you have any questions, comments, if there's anything else uh, you'd like to see, make sure to leave those in the comments below. And again, this is Ben with Shock Service LLC and shockservice.com. Thanks again for watching.